So welcome to Tech TV, brought to you by London Tech Week and Tech Accelerate. We're delighted to have a new healthcare media initiative, Priority Zero, on board as our think tank partner for Health Tech Summit this year at the virtual London Tech Week Festival. I'm pleased to have with us today Dennis Kogan, founder and host of Priority Zero, who is here to discuss the new initiative, Pandemic Predictions, and the role of AI and data in healthcare today. Thanks for joining me and the London Tech Week community online today, Dennis. Thank you for inviting me. So to start off, uh, would you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your career journey into the health tech sector? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Dennis Kogan and I'm an entrepreneur and investor in automation and AI in healthcare. Uh, I've co-founded several ventures and currently I'm leading Care Syntax, which is a global automation platform that focuses on decreasing risk of surgical procedures. And a bit about myself, I consider myself more so a global pioneer in the healthcare AI space, building teams and products actually in various key markets, also sort of fairly far outside the typical clusters of innovation like San Francisco or Boston. For example, in Europe, in Germany, we've built up very significant uh, R&D presence as well. And so for me, this has actually been uh, an exhil exhilarating journey uh, as I sort of truly understand that human health and advances in improving it are actually a universal priority that supersedes politics or any other short-term priorities and frankly that is true wherever you are in the world. True now more than ever for sure and um, that's great so could you introduce Priority Zero and just provide some color on why you decided to start it? Sure thing. So Priority Zero is an online media resource uh, dedicated to innovation and entrepreneurship and health tech. Uh, Today, it's based on LinkedIn newsletters and podcasts uh, that I co-author with various thought leaders from the industry. But I do draw inspiration from larger resources like Andreas and Horowitz and Reid Hoffman's Masters of Scale, hoping to build up a media program that can truly add value to the business community in many different ways. And as to why I decided to start it, well, it's a, it's a, it's a funny year, as you know. Uh, some months ago, I found myself in a sudden position of somewhat of a proprietary awareness of what's happening on the ground in, in the healthcare systems uh, based on the data access that we have at Care Syntax, which you know, has a lot of ways to, to see how surgical volume keeps going up and down and where and to which extent. And what I realized at the time that what we see on the ground and what's sort of being reported, what was being perceived top down in the media or in the community is not always in sync. And so there were a lot of misconceptions and lag in how uh, these things uh, sort of were reported and understood. And, and I think being an insider at the time and, and now I, I saw a lot of interesting business community response to the COVID-19 fight. And I felt like then I still feel like that a lot of the solutions made sense and do make sense, make sense now and are timely. But there are also others that I think got a bit more coverage and buzz than they probably should have uh, in, in the time of a crisis. And while being interesting long-term, maybe are less of a priority today. So, you know, priority zero was uh, and is intending to be a bit of a bridge maker that I think is needed between the insider knowledge of those of us inside healthcare and the broader business and investor community uh, in order to drive awareness more appropriately and actually shed light on some of the enduring drivers that I think will persist post COVID and cutting through the clutter of those things that may uh, not uh, warrant attention right now. Great, thank you. That sounds really exciting. You mentioned at the beginning there kind of the new drivers and um, I saw that you and your friends, Professor Daniel Eisenberg and Eric Schultz, um, have created kind of a map for these drivers of changes that will endure post-pandemic in healthcare. So with the pandemic bringing this renewed focus to several issues, what do you predict are the big things you expect to change in the healthcare sector post-pandemic? Yeah, these are tough questions, but um, I do have some thoughts. Um, I mean, firstly, the reason why I personally think that some changes are definitely coming is because healthcare has lost a bit of its invincibility status, hasn't it, right? So we always thought, or at least I have thought of healthcare as an impenetrable fortress of sorts where you can always go there to a hospital, and you can always get treatment, and maybe it's not a best service experience, but you could get it. And over the last six months in very dramatic situations in many cities around the world, you simply sometimes couldn't get that treatment. And so what I think we saw in the last six months showed us that there are still forces we have to reckon with that can put healthcare literally on its knees. 
And I think from patient perspective, it showed us that we're actually quite vulnerable. And this vulnerability means sort of lack of resilience in the supply of actual healthcare, where we realize that we could be in a situation where we might not get this help. And so I think this warrants some renewed focus on many different things, including the things that we may have previously discounted, you know, uh, lifestyle illnesses like obesity that we sort of stopped treating as a, as a, as a problem and in COVID times became uh, kind of a catalyst of uh, severity. And so uh, I think in the end, uh, there are so many things that we should be tackling more aggressively. Uh, and this renewed focus and maybe even fear that COVID brought, I, Personally, I don't know if it's controversial, but I think it has somewhat of a silver lining because I think it will push governments and businesses to, to really build this resilience in providing healthcare and innovate uh, the treatments, maybe without getting stuck in the complexity of healthcare from you know, higher macro level issues like reimbursement or regulatory. And I think if that happens, that is a net positive for us as patients, as long as of course we manage the safety of this innovation if we do that, we'll see a quicker path to adoption. I think it'll, it'll, it'll save lives. Absolutely. No, that really resonates. And we've been discussing this week in the London Tech Leap community quite a lot about this invisible third wave that the World Economic Forum has mentioned, which is the rise of non-COVID related illnesses um, and how their treatment is and will continue to rise um, and suffer. Um, so now your own path is very much focused on that kind of intersection of healthcare AI and various medical use cases. Can you um, explain a little bit more about the role of data and AI in supporting these changes? Sure. Well, you know, at, at the core data and machine learning built models, so what's called AI broadly, are uh, at their core a catalyst that actually boost some functions of core underlying products, right? So it's not a product in its own right, it's an input. So just like electricity gave us light and long distance voice transmission, AI gives us this acceleration to do other things, to, to figure out the roots and causes of various problems that we're trying to solve. For example, um, if you look at early, I think it was early December of last year, uh, an AI was actually able to pick up abnormal pneumonias in Wuhan before we knew that it was part of COVID, right? And I think in this instance, it could have given us maybe some preemptive power to do something different, but I think it was an excellent example of the power of AI uh, to be a catalyst to understand more quickly the more advanced mechanisms of healthcare emergencies and also how our bodies work, right? So models based on clinical data can suggest connections that can accelerate the search for these solutions, including higher efficacy vaccines and drugs. And in a more advanced scenario, something I'm personally very excited about, they, they don't only give you sort of one size fits all solutions, but they actually help you tailor it to individuals or smaller cohorts of patients with unique profiles to make them more and more receptive to specific clinical treatments. So overall, I think it's an exciting uh, mechanism to accelerating things. Great, thank you. And um, why is it, do you say, that the media attention to healthcare AI is actually more glamorous than the reality of building the solutions with AI in mind? Yeah, sure. And it's sometimes strange for me to sort of say that because I'm obviously part of the space and it's, mm. it's nice to be perceived as, as, as a bit of a buccaneer. But I think people automatically think that the bulk of value and intelligence comes from the actual machine learning aspect in a sense that machines can learn and produce these algorithms and the intelligence is immediately valuable to, to humanity. I think the reality of it, that this part, while complex and exciting, is sort of midstream and there are tons of things that come before and after before it becomes a product that we as consumers and patients can use. So, you know, sometimes when I try to explain this, I think of actually parallels in other industries and there are interesting ones. Uh, so if you think of oil and gas and the energy ecosystem, you think of how sort of oil becomes gasoline, right? Before it becomes you know, something we put in our cars, it's crude raw oil that needs to be found and secured and processed and converted to all these intermediate products that by themselves are not maybe commercial yet, but they become with further processing these petroleum products, which then we <laughs> actually feed to mechanisms that drive and fly, et cetera. And I think today people in healthcare think of these intermediates maybe as more of an end game. And I think it's just not correct because there's a lot of 
non-glamorous work that goes before and after uh, this fact. So, you know, before you even get the, the healthcare algorithm up and running, you need the, a really good set of data with the right volume. You need to secure it, especially in healthcare, uh, in terms of legal and regulatory obligations that, that you have, you need to structure it. And structuring itself is, is not an automatic exercise as well. It's a massive undertaking that actually requires human input and labor to annotate and curate the data so the machines can actually learn from it. Uh, and then, you know, the algorithm creation indeed is a challenging process, right? It's iterative. You need to test hypotheses, you need to iterate and repeat so you can create a robust model that can predict and decide. And finally, right, not to be too long-winded about this, but even when you get that, then you need to embed this algorithm into a real product, a real container, a surgical robot, you know, whatever it is, a piece of software, because an algorithm for, let's say, predicting or, or somehow assessing a tumor itself cannot be consumed by a healthcare professional. It has to be part of something else to be useful. And that's classic product management that yet again has all the regulatory requirements and, and documentation requirements. So as you can see, you know, there's an entire value chain that needs to be built out around the healthcare needs in AI. And uh, it's a lot of tough work and it's an exciting output, but it's also a lot of uh, practical getting your hands dirty aspects. No, that's a really interesting point. Thank you, Dennis. And um, before you go, do you have any final predictions and or wishes for a post pandemic world that you can share with us? Right, yet another tough question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I only have my own opinions. Um, from that perspective, I do think, just like most of us, that vaccines are going to settle this COVID topic, right? And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later, and it will be effective. And so I'm, in general, quite optimistic about, about this uh, emergency concluding. My wish, however, is that we're not over-relying on this one therapy in terms of drawing conclusions, because I'd love for us to make sure that the learnings stay with us and we continue pushing to improve and innovate healthcare in a way that when a new threat comes, we're able to act much more rapidly and surgically to sort of prevent these issues from spilling over. Because I think there is a risk in my opinion that we'll just forget and we'll move on reverting to the same modus operandi, same issues, right? There's so much to gain, I think, in areas like precision medicine, supply chain resilience, that it will be a, a grave mistake to treat a vaccine as the, the only solution. I think we need other tools. And I think if you look into history, every crisis has been an opportunity to correct the weak links in the system. You know, post 9-11 in the United States, post Great Recession globally, and maybe now, right? So I think my wish is that even if and when the vaccine is there and it will work, we don't put our foot off the gas in terms of innovation and continue fixing and innovating ourselves out of some of the problems that our society for sure will continue having. You know, we talked about this obesity, inefficient resources, intransparent pricing. There are so many problems to tackle and all are feasible, uh, I guess, as long as there's this ability from all of us to take risks and commit resources from all the key actors, including the entrepreneurs in our community here. And so I think we really uh, must get our brightest mind in this vertical to unlock all this value. And if we do, then I think we'll come out stronger and healthier. That's a nice positive note to end on. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I really look forward to tuning into your session at London Technique Virtual in September at the Health Tech Summit. And let's hope we get a vaccine soon. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Look forward to it.